Mark is the first gospel written in the New Testament, probably written some 20 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's also the shortest of the gospels, just 16 chapters. And the resurrection, which is the end of Mark's gospel, only takes eight verses. So we're going to read that together. Mark, the 16th chapter, and beginning with verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. <laughs> Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth? He was crucified, but he's risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? Now go tell his disciples, and don't forget Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, I don't know how that last line reads in the original Greek. I do know that in the revised Alabama version, it reads, they didn't say nothing to nobody because they were scared to death. <laughs> you can imagine, these three women, it had been a tough time. They had been there at the crucifixion. They had been part of taking him down and doing what could be done and in the very short time before the sun went down and he was laid in the tomb. They hadn't had much sleep. Right after the Sabbath was over, they, they had somehow bargained with a shopkeeper to open up so they could buy some spices. And here, before it's even daylight, they're out, probably by themselves, probably in the dark, just before sunrise, headed toward the tomb, and it's nothing like what they ever expected. But there was a job to be done. There was a job to be done, and the women would be about doing it. Halfway there. Half, what are we going to do about that stone? We can't get that thing back by ourselves. And in a few paces, they look up, and, and that's been done, and they walk up to the opening to the tomb, and, and there's a man, somebody they don't recognize. It said a man dressed in white, and uh, he has a message for them. You're looking for Jesus? Not here. <laughs> He's not here. He's risen. Now go tell his disciples and tell Peter. And trembling, bewildered, and afraid, they flee from the tomb. The end. That's the end of Mark's gospel. That's all he says. Now, if you were reading along, your Bible might have had a few more verses. They were added later. Somebody else was uncomfortable about this ending so abruptly, and they added words. So there's a shorter ending to Mark. It's, it's about a paragraph. There's a longer ending. Some Bibles put both the long and the short ending together and, and make it even longer. Nevertheless, you can tell the writing is different. The tone, the character, the nature of what's written is just different. Mark ends rather abruptly, and he ends before the men showed up at all. The men are absent from Mark's gospel. Nobody says anything about the disciples or the men in Mark. About 20 years after Mark was written, Matthew and Luke got around to writing their versions of that story. And then maybe 10 years after that, we don't know for sure, John wrote a fourth version. They're all different. 
Matthew tells us that there was an angel rather than a man sitting there by the grave. And he also tells us about the guards, the Roman guards. He says, Matthew says there was an earthquake and those guards were knocked flat on their faces and they really didn't know what was going on and they fled that place. Went to the priest and told the priest about it and they made up a story and and that story, Matthew said, is still <laughs> circulating today that somehow the disciples had gotten past the guards and stolen Jesus' body. Luke says there were two men, not an angel, but two men. And John says there were two angels. Luke and John tell us that Peter was one of the first guys to get to the tomb. Actually, Luke only tells us about Peter. John tells us about Peter and someone he calls the other disciple who accompanied Peter to the tomb. In fact, beat him there because he was a faster runner, but Peter was the first one who stuck his head in the tomb and was told the same thing. All four gospel writers, despite their differences in their stories, agreed on four things. They agreed on four things. The stone was rolled away. They'll tell us that. Tomb was empty. That's the second thing they agreed on. The third thing they agreed on is he's not here. Jesus the Nazarene? He's not here. He told you. He told you to expect this. Finally, all four gospel writers agree that Mary Magdalene was at the tomb. I love that. I love that because if Mary Magdalene was at the tomb, maybe there's a place for me there too. Maybe. It's been 15 years or so now, when I think about it, it seems like yesterday that within a year's time, we buried both of my parents. I remember going back to the grave a day or so after I'm sure you've done that too. And it's a different, it's a different thing. The, the canopy that was there is gone. That fake grass carpet that's around the grave, that's gone too. The flowers are beginning to wilt a little. They don't look as good as they did yesterday or the day before. And there's a mound of red clay in Alabama over the casket of the person that I love, over the body of the person that I love. Chances are you've been there too. Some of you have lost a spouse. Some may have lost a child, God forbid. All of us have been there because we've all lost friends. I know you were there because I saw your name in the signature book. We've all mourned. We've all mourned the tragedy of this bruised and wounded world. We've all faced the shattering disappointment of death. We have all been there at the tomb.
Well, it's been a week now. Uh, Passover has, well, it's passed over. <laughs> the, uh, the, the tourists have gone home. The street sweepers have been busy all week getting the city back in shape. The, the garbage picker-uppers have been picking up and hauling stuff out. The storekeepers have been taking inventory and restocking the shelves. When I walked to synagogue this morning, the streets were really quiet, especially compared to last week with all the events that went on then and all the people that were here. Service was pretty good today. Music was good. It wasn't like this, but it was pretty good. The, the Torah reading was familiar and comforting. And the message, the message was good. We, we talk about it a lot. Will the Messiah ever come? Will we ever be delivered from Roman rule? Gives us pause to think. Once the service was over, we exited the synagogue and, and we kind of gathered on the street to, in groups to, to chat and catch up on what was going on. I, I've heard you guys call that hanging out. That has a different meaning in our culture, but you would understand. So there were four or five of us in the group, and someone said, did you see the headlines? Did you see the headlines Tuesday in the Jerusalem Street Journal? What headlines? Empty tomb. That's all it said. Empty tomb. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, I can tell you what I think. The article below it said, women showed up at the tomb first. Give me a break. Who would have planned it that way? You can't even accept their testimony in court. But women showed up there. I'll tell you what I think happened. I think they went to the wrong tomb, really. It was dark. They hadn't had much sleep. They were emotionally distraught. And they went to the wrong tomb. So they shouldn't have expected a body in it. And that... That thing about the man sitting there in white, I don't know. Maybe it was a hallucination or something. That, that's what I think. What do you think? I'll tell you what I think. I, I, I don't think he was dead at all. I've seen people hanging on those crosses for two full days. One guy, one guy actually made it into the third day before he quit breathing. How long was this one on the cross? Five hours, six, I don't know. I think he just fainted, appeared dead. They took him down from the cross. They put him in the tomb. And after some period of time in the cool darkness of that tomb, he started to come around. Don't ask me how the stone got rolled back. I'm not sure he could have done that, but I'm not sure he was dead. How about you? What, what, what do you think happened? <laughs> I think it was grave robbers. That's what I think. That's what the priests said. They said it was grave robbers, and in fact, they identified the grave robbers as the disciples. They said they took him, hit him. Now, I, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't see what motive they might have had, but there were those who thought the priest might have done it too, and there was a motive there. If he had laid there in that tomb, they'd have probably turned it into a shrine or a temple or something like that, and it would have been a big attraction. And it, it just so maybe it was the priest, but I, I think it's grave robbing. So then they looked at me and said, Well, what do you think? What do you think? Well, I'm a doctor, I've seen a lot of people die. He was dead. I'm clear on that. He had been beaten within an inch of his life and then beaten again within an inch of his life. 
He certainly hadn't had enough to drink all day. He was, he was in shock a good share of that time. And then they nailed him to the cross, and I, I, he was dead. He, he didn't, well, to be sure, they didn't break his legs, but they took a spear and rammed it in far enough to, to be sure that, that he was dead. The other thing I'm pretty clear on is the tomb was empty. Everybody said that. Everybody, nobody has denied that that tomb was empty. Nobody's tried to say that there was a body there. And the thing about the women, it just has to be true. Nobody would have concocted a story about the empty tomb featuring women if they wanted anybody to believe it. So that story has to be true. They told it because it was true. How about you? How about, what are you going to say when they, when they look at you? What are you going to say? Well, one thing you can say is, here's what I've been hearing around town. People are saying that they've seen him. Mary said that. Mary Magdalene, well, discount that if you want to, but there were a couple of tourists who left Passover to go back home in a little town called Emmaus, and they said he showed up and walked with them most of the way, talked with them. And when they sat down for dinner and he raised his hands to pray, there were wounds. Looked like nail prints to me. And then those gang of ruffians that he calls disciples, they said they saw him too. He's showing up. So that, that might be something you could say. I'll tell you something else that, that you might say. I know a couple of the disciples. We went to academy together. Now, we haven't, we've kind of lost track, I'll admit that, but, but I, know, I knew those guys pretty well a few years ago. And I can tell you that at the cross, at the crucifixion, they scattered like scared chickens to the four winds. They were gone. And they didn't show up first at the tomb either. But let me tell you what. By Tuesday, they're different. They're different. Not scared anymore. They're optimistic. They're joyful. Just think about that. It's, they're changed. They're different. I'd suggest that you tell them to wait a little bit before making a judgment. Wait and see. I don't think this story is quite over yet. You never know. You never know.
The Apostle Paul didn't buy this thing to start with. In fact, he actively took it on and did everything he could to destroy the idea that a resurrection had taken place. But in his letter, his first letter to the Corinthians, he writes this. See if you see a change of mind here. I don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or, in fact, to grieve like those who have no hope. Because we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, and so we believe that Jesus will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, there's a change of mind. There's a witness that changed his mind. He goes on to tell about other witnesses in what is probably the first of these Christian creeds, he talks about the disciples seeing him. He says at one time there were 500 people who showed up and saw him and can testify to it. And then finally he appeared to me. To me. Why is that important? That's important because Thessalonians says... We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. A couple hundred years went by. Six, eight generations of Christians born and died, still looking for that, and, and, and they thought, let's put together a summary of our beliefs. So they did. It's only about 14 lines. It's called the Apostles' Creed. Not going to read all of it to you, but I want to read some parts. They started out by saying, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And then they say, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Amen. Then they talk about another half dozen things that they believed in. The Holy Spirit, the church, the communion, the community of the saints, forgiveness of sins. And finally, they close it out with, we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now, that's not proof. It's not. I don't have proof for you today. I think we have trustworthy witnesses. Paul, who changed his mind. Peter, who betrayed his Lord and came back and said, I get it, and, and ended up being hung in similar fashion to his Lord. Trustworthy witnesses, I think the evidence is, fact, is in fact pretty compelling too. A tomb was empty. I think those people who showed up that early morning did see and hear somebody saying, you're not here, he's risen, go and tell his disciples. Believe that. Pretty good evidence for that. But evidence will not get us home either. There's not enough evidence to constitute foolproof. But Hebrews says that faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. So if you take the evidence and you put hope on top of that, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. That's called faith. When you took evidence and you put hope together, it becomes faith. And I believe faith is enough. I think faith is enough to get us home. There's a little boy named Billy. Billy lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. His mother was an ICU, ICU nurse at one of the large hospitals there. Uh, Billy, at age five, was diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma. It's a crummy, almost uniformly fatal disease. 
He had really good treatment in Albuquerque. They did everything they could for him, but after a period of a few months, it, it was clear that it wasn't working and, and Billy's health was declining. His mom's parents lived in Boston, and she wanted to take Billy to see them, what might be one last time. And, and while she was there, she wanted to get a second opinion at Boston Children's Hospital, one of our finest children's hospitals then and still today. So Billy and his mom got on an airplane, flew to Boston. They had only been there a few days when Billy's condition declined rather precipitously. It was clear he was going downhill. There was really nothing more to do for him. By this time, his dad had arrived in Boston too, and now the parents wanted more than anything to get Billy back to Albuquerque. They said, we just, we don't want to take him home in a box. Billy couldn't travel by himself, not even with his parents. He had tubes and wires and that sort of thing. So a young pediatric resident volunteered to attend Billy on his trip from Boston to Albuquerque. Her name was Hope. Hope ran home, put a note on the refrigerator, gone to New Mexico, back tomorrow. <laughs> and she got back and she and Billy and his parents got on an airplane to head to Albuquerque. Now, Billy had wires and tubes and stuff like that. They would never have let him on the plane if they had known that. It was before the days of all the security we have today. So Hope just wrapped a blanket around all of that with Billy and they got on the plane. It was not a nonstop flight. They had a, a brief layover in Dallas and Fort Worth, and somewhere between ba uh, Boston and Dallas, Billy stirred and complained of pain, and, and Hope administered some medication. It seemed to help him, but it also caused an immediate reaction who brought Billy to the attention of, of the flight attendants who said, when we get to Dallas, you're going to have to leave this plane, and we cannot take you on to Albuquerque with this sick child. So by now it's getting to be afternoon and evening when they land and they ended up in a small emergency room uh, somewhere on the outskirts of Fort Worth. And uh, Hope is there with a very sick child and two distraught parents. What is she to do? She called Medivac and said, can, can you Medivac us to Albuquerque? And they said, no, we, we respond to emergencies, but not to something that is clearly um, headed downhill so quickly. It's getting late in the evening now, and finally Hope said to the emergency room staff, do you know a doctor who flies? They said, yeah, Dr. Smith just got his license a couple months ago. She called Dr. Smith told him the story. Dr. Smith said, I'll be there. And he came, and they spent the next couple hours getting his little airplane ready to fly. Hope said that it looked on the tarmac like a Volkswagen with wings. That's <laughs> what she said. She arranged for his parents to get on a commercial flight to Albuquerque that would land somewhere around the time that they thought they would get there, and they they planned th their flight in the little plane to, to arrive sometime just after sunrise. I think that that pilot wasn't ready to encounter that big mountain on the outsides of Albuquerque, uh, unless there was some daylight there. So they took off. So at some time during that flight, Billy aroused again a little bit and said, where are we? Hope said, you're going home, Billy. And he went back to sleep. They landed right around sunrise. Um, Billy's parents were there. There was an ambulance there from the hospital where his mom worked. They loaded everybody up, whisked them to the hospital. Hope found a place to shower and to change into some clean scrubs and prepared to go back home to Boston. Three hours later, surrounded by his family and friends, Billy breathed his last. About a month later, Hope received a letter from Billy's mom, and included in that envelope was a photograph. 
I'll read it for you. Billy, uh, 1972 to 1977, hope brought him home. Peter, one of those witnesses, talks about that. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. New birth, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I know that hope brought Billy home. I believe hope will take him home again. I believe that. Speaking of women witnesses, a little woman who wrote a lot of books a long time ago said this in her book, Desire of Ages. Look not to the empty tomb. Mourn, not as those who are hopeless and helpless. Jesus lives. And because he lives, we shall live also. From grateful hearts, let the glad song ring out, Christ is risen. Grasp this hope. Believe and see the glory of God.
When the early Christians greeted each other, the standard greeting went like this. One would say, he is risen. And the response is, was, he is risen indeed. Would you, would you do that with me? So I'll, I'll start and, and you do the response. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That was actually pretty good. It was better than first service. <laughs> but I think you can do better. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Go now in full assurance of eternal life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is risen. He is risen indeed.